Hi, this is Carl Strauchan, the fireman from uh, Twin Peaks, and you're listening to Without Your Head. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by Maurice Himes, writer and director of Chimera. How are you doing tonight? Very well, Neil. Um, enjoying uh, beautiful sunny weather in Porto, Portugal. And thank you for having me on your show. Thanks for coming on. Uh, real quick, what's Portugal like? Is, uh, I find out it's your first time there. I've never been there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a gorgeous country. And everything you see in the movies about um, you know, historical European cities is absolutely true. Um, it's just very nice and friendly people. Um, you know, late lunches and uh, late uh, evening, you know, late dinners. And somehow this week, the weather's just been gorgeous. Uh, the sun's been out. We've done a little bit of walking and sightseeing. And it's, uh, yeah, overall, it's a fantastic place. Highly recommend if anybody wants to come out and, uh, you know, just spend a, a few days. Yeah. So are you, are you there for, for, the, uh, for the screening of Chimera at the festival? Yes. Yes, I am. There's there's a festival uh, that I don't know if you're aware of. It's called Fantasporto. It's one of the I'm, I'm not I'm not going to say the oldest because I don't know that to be true, but it's one of the older uh, fantastic film festivals in Europe. Certainly, um, it's this is its 38th edition. And oh, wow. uh, Chimera, yeah, yeah. So it's been around for a long time, and obviously, the early entrance into the whole fantastic film. Um, you know, festival space, and we were thrilled that they like Chimera and they feature Chimera. They have a special um, bioethics bio in cinema panel discussion, and um, because that's a big issue that Chimera kind of, you know, nothing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as saying addresses, but certainly adds a voice to the debate. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've been featured in that in that panel, and you know, we're just enjoying the festival, enjoying the city. Yeah, I think that's what good science fiction does. Is it, uh, like I said, opens up debate. Uh, I think you know, um, you know, some people might think science fiction is kind of like uh, people shooting lasers and stuff, but I always think good science fiction is really talking about something that's topical um, and discussing it, you know, in a in a setting that's fantastical. Yeah, yeah, and, and in an open minded way where you sort of explore what would happen if. And I think um, it's really more interesting if the storyteller, you know, whether it's a writer or a comic book um, or, or a film or TV show, kind of approaches it without a preconceived notion of good and bad. Um, because, you know, all science, all development, all technology, you've got people that can argue either side about whether in the grand scheme of things there's good or bad for us. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when that debate opens up, I think that's when you get insights not just into the science itself but into sort of the nature of um uh, of, of, of our civilization of humanity of who we are and you know why we why we are here and what are we doing uh, yeah so some kind of bigger yeah. questions some, sometimes open up sometimes mm -hmm. uh and, and for people who aren't aware of the movie yet uh can you give them an idea of what the film's about and some of the topics you guys that you discuss in the movie yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the just the simple one sentence log line, if I remember it right, is that, you know, a, a brilliant but disturbed uh, scientist freezes his children alive while he races against time to cure their um, terminal genetic disease by unlocking the secrets of immortality that is uh, hidden inside the DNA of the Turritopsis um, immortal jellyfish. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of under this fantastical pr uh, premise, what we look at is some of the technology that's in very nascent stages today, but maybe 50 years from now might be much further along. And what that would mean, such mm -hmm. as the ability to, to preserve a, an individual and restore them to full functioning uh, capacity, um, sort of bring them back to life, resurrect them. And so we kind of look at that uh, and what that would mean, um, whether there are things you can do in terms of gene editing, gene engineering, 
uh, that would change the longevity of, um, of, of, hum of human beings. And, you know, we explore other sort of technologies that are being looked at and worked on in universities and labs across the world, um, like, like organ sort of harvesting or, or, you know, growing human organs within other animals and pigs are the ones that come to mind and what we've used in the film. Um, so, so it's, we look at all of this science and technology and, and, and explore whether at some point in the future it might be possible to extend lifespans beyond what we consider to be normal today. Yeah. So when, when, did, um, when did you come up with the idea for the movie? And like kind of where were you in life? Uh, was, was, were these things that you were thinking about yourself? Um, no, it, it, it wasn't. Obviously, these are not things that you know, typically one would, one would uh, kind of think about. But a couple of things happened uh -huh. in my life. And, um, and I'm, I'm an engineer by training. And I uh, have been, I've, I've had kind of a roundabout career. But I, at that point, I, I was a software entrepreneur. And I run a little software business with my friend and, and, and business partner, Jay, who produced the film with me. Um, so the two of us were kind of going about our business. And... Um, and we had started to become, um, in, well, I had become, I always loved writing and I'd become interested in doing something different. Um, I was kind of approaching my, at that point, my mid to late 40s. And I, I felt like I, I wanted to try, try my hand at sort of this fourth career in the creative world. Um, but a couple of things happened at a personal level to me. Um, and my wife's family, you know, they, they diagnosed that uh, there is a genetic condition. And, and I learned that there was a 50% chance that each of my three kids might have it. And that prompted me to go and do a lot of research into how, into this whole science of genetics. Um, another very dear friend um, lost his 19-year-old daughter to um, a liver uh, disease. And, and she uh, survived two um, successive liver transplants before eventually succumbing to that. Um, and my, my little nephew, um, who is actually in the film, have you seen the camera? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen it. So there's a yes. little boy, okay, uh, without giving any spoilers away or anything, but there's a little boy in there um, who appears in a dream sequence and then again towards the very end. That little boy is my nephew, and you know, he very bravely fought and survived leukemia when he was three years old um, and underwent for five years this crippling regime of chemo and, and radiation and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, that prompted me to look at what sort of stem cells and bone marrow and, and all of that space. And, you know, all of this was kind of mixed up in my head. And um, this typically would be the sort of thing that would, you know, that a writer would take and try to do a drama of some sort. But to me, you know, I didn't feel that I would, that I would be able to do justice to these stories. Um, um, because there's just so much, what should I say? It's just, well, I, I felt that I wasn't the right person to write a drama about, about these events. But instead what I did is I took everything I learned and I um, made it into a completely unrelated um, but yet inspired by those events, inspired by the research that happened as a result of those events, um, into a fantastical story that looks at, you know, whether in the future we might not have people, and I, and I hope that we'll, you know, medicine will develop to a point where near and dear ones to us won't have these kind of health um, risks, uh, health problems, and you won't lose people at young ages. And, you know, it's a, it's a hope, it's a dream. Maybe someday it'll be true. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, and then it asks, you know, when you're watching it, uh, you know, like the uh, if that's a moral thing, a moral immoral thing, and uh, some of the things that would come up. Because obviously, I think when people talk about these things or, or they research it, it's always trying to find uh, a, a, a positive solution for people to help people. But uh, then there can always be things that come out of that that's not necessarily positive. Right, right. And, and there's always this belief, you know, there's, there's I think the most uh, common argument I've heard is that, you know, we were not intended to do against, against many of these developments. Um, that we, you know, it was never intended. God never intended us to do these things. I mean, if you believe in, you know, in whatever, whatever your religious beliefs are, and some people 
Um, so I don't want to offend anyone, but if you believe in there, there's a grand design, then as part of that grand design was there sort of a plan for us to tinker with our own bodies, with our own DNA, with our genetic makeup. Um, mm-hmm. and, and if you do, you know, what are the possible results that can come off that and can that be misused? Um, I think these are all just fascinating issues to think about and to talk about. Um, and maybe they'll happen in our lifetime. Maybe we'll get to see some of that. Yeah. And then it also brings up the question of um, if we weren't meant to, uh, to, 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 to look into these things, why would, why would man have the intelligence to even pursue it? It, it, that's exactly the point. And, and I think at one point in Chimera as well, one of the characters kind of makes that argument. And I think that's a very valid argument is you've got this, uh, in, you know, the human collectively, the human intellect, um, and, and of course, individuals leading the way um, are capable of amazing uh, breakthroughs and, you know, ideas and sort of not just philosophical, but problem solving and so you've got that capacity and it seems like it'd be a waste um unless it was you know intended for us to to to, to explore not just our surroundings not just you know space and earth and but even our own bodies mm-hmm. um about the the immortal jellyfish i uh seen like uh stuff like this on on tv and stuff uh when did you come about the you know, the idea to include uh, the jellyfish. The jellyfish. Yeah, I, um, so I, I knew about the jellyfish and, um, you know, I, I, I had read about it. It's a fascinating little creature. It's, it's tiny and, you know, it may not um, have the kind of um, scientific potential that I think we've exaggerated that a little bit. In the, mm-hmm. We've exaggerated its applicability to, um, to, to, to mankind. Um, to some extent, the, the, the jellyfish itself is believed, in fact, to be immortal. It has a life cycle that it appears to have the ability to to reverse. Like recycle, and yeah, yeah. It goes back to a youthful, healthier stage if it is injured or um, or if it, you know, it's it's dying. It is able to revert itself. So that is, is an amazing ability. Um, whether in, in fact it can be applied to to mankind, I. I you know, the jury's out, I think, completely on that. Uh, but we've kind of taken that, we've rolled with that in the film a little bit, so that's kind of a leap of faith that we've made. But yeah, I became aware of it. I, um, you know, did a little bit of research about it, and then I came across this uh, amazing um, video on, on YouTube, I think it might still be up, about a Japanese uh, professor, <coughs> and, and a researcher at a lab in, in Japan who's studying these jellyfish, and he's so fascinated by them. He's dedicated his entire life to these, these creatures and you know there's a, there's a video of him wearing a jellyfish um hat and he's singing a song in japanese about the jellyfish and i just that i watched that about five years ago and it was stuck in my head yeah. i couldn't get it out <laughs> yeah. um, so i i'm gonna have to now that now that you brought it up and we've talked about it i'm gonna look it up i hope it's still up there and if i do yeah, I'll, I'll I'm gonna look it up too, so. all right sounds good and i i think when you include <laughs> Yeah, I sure. think when you include stuff that people may or may not know, but it is, uh, you know, some of this, it's out there like uh, chirogen, uh, chir- chirogenics and, and the jellyfish stuff. And uh, it adds a bit of realism when you're watching it, because uh, you know that people are at least, you know, researching these ideas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love science fiction. I love every kind of science fiction. But for, for me, um, you know, I, there's kind of two things that I... I think um, as a writer, I, I set myself in terms of constraints. And, and the first was that I, when I started writing, it was my first time writing a screenplay, I'd never done anything before, um, that I didn't want to write something in the um, sort of impossible realm. And what I meant is you know, with faster than light space travel or with time travel or, or for that matter, even with aliens um, I, I, or, or, or monsters or creatures. Um, I, I, I didn't want to... I set myself a constraint of trying to stay planted within what might be plausible, you know, within the next mm-hmm. near, near future, maybe even the end, towards the end of my own lifetime. Um, the, other, the other constraint I set upon myself was that the story itself 
must be compatible with the world as we know it. Um, so, you know, the end must be, must be such, or the, well, throughout, it must be such that, you know, if the events as depicted in the film were taking place in our, in our world, they could be taking place in this world, uh, in our world as we know it today. Um, and it, it, those were the constraints I set myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not in any way trying to say that uh, it's, it's not fun to watch time travel. I love that. I love all those, sure, sure. those films sure. and uh, or monster films or alien films. But um, I just, when I set out to write Chimera, that was, those were the two constraints I set for myself. And um, I think the speculation is you're taking it forward 30 years, maybe 25 years, maybe 50 years. But mm -hmm. things like this are going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I mean, like yeah. even the, the yeah, the, the chirogenics, I mean, that's been around for years. You always hear, you know, the rumors that, you know, Walt, Walt Disney, you know, froze his own head, you know, in case, uh, yeah. you know, in the future they could, uh, you know, cure whatever and bring him back. Right. So, so that's part of it. And there are, there's, there's a company in Arizona that, that, you know, you can, you can have yourself frozen, your whole body or your head. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the theory being that at some point in the future, they might be able to bring you back kind of like vanilla sky. I think if you remember that film, yeah. Um, with Tom Cruise had looked at that scenario. Um, but what I'm talking about is the fact that more recently, there are researchers that are looking at how, you know, whether, freeze, whether freezing will be the way to, to treat um, people who are injured in accidents, um, whether you can, in fact, uh, pump the blood out of the body, uh, replace it with... Um, you know, lower lower the temperature, um, replace it with uh, replace the blood with a um, if another fluid that that doesn't freeze and mm -hmm. lower the metabolism rate and thereby gain a few hours and be able to transport the individual to a proper medical facility where they can be treated and their life could be saved potentially. And there's mm -hmm. you know they they've had some success working with dogs and we kind of look at that in our in our film we take in Chimera we take that um, work that's taking place and um, and extend it say okay let's assume like with most human endeavors when the best brains apply themselves they usually find a way of of breaking through uh, and if they did break through then um, you know could that technology be applied very realistically to people who are sick and, and then you know down the road um bring them back when we have a, a solution to their mm -hmm. whatever plagues them yeah so it's yeah it's, yeah. it's <laughs> so that, that that's some of that stuff is real it's not just um you know the company in arizona i think there's one in the uk that, that have been doing it for a while and 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 they may well be on the right track i'm, I'm not aware of you know what what's going to happen down the road but i was kind of a little bit more um, I think it was University of Pittsburgh that I remember um, the, some of the research that I did um, where in the labs there, they're, they're, they're working with, um, with dogs and they've had some success. And I think it's, it's not a lot, but like, well, you can bring them back after an hour um, or maybe a little bit longer. And, you know, if, if you can get, it's like the first computer chip. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the moment you are able to move from from va vacuum tubes to integrated circuits, then, you know, today's um, parallel processing supercomputers are within reach. Um, so in the same way, the moment you're able to do one hour, the question is not can you do one year? I mean, with time, will, will the technology improve to the point where you could put somebody or, or even an animal, not necessarily a human being, but, you know, get into cryogenic preservation for a year and then bring them back? And if you can, mm -hmm. if you can do one hour, the why is one year not within reach? You know, with some time and with technology and development. And then if one year is within reach, then why is a hundred years not within reach? Yeah. Um, and you got to. So it's it's a fascinating space. The whole thing. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned earlier about um, you know kind of the, the when the idea started about passing on um, something to your children. Uh, do you think having children changes your view on a lot of these things? Um, he, yes, it, it kind of has to, because um, I think part of what most parents, I think, will agree with me, that um, part of having children is, of course, you want the best for your child, and you'll do everything within your power uh, for them. 
but you also hope that um, you know they will live in a better world than what you're living in, um, and that I think is maybe it's more subtle and maybe less. Um, you know, we don't talk about it as much, but um, I think most parents hope that, um, and and in their own way, they kind of try to contribute to and shape the world so that the world that their children are going to live in will hopefully be more humane, uh, you know, gentler, kinder, better, uh, however you want to define that. And um, I think I think you not, not, it doesn't mean that people who don't have children don't want to see the world improve. Sure, but it's, sure. I, it's just the... Yeah, for me, I have a stake now <laughs> in, in the future right, right. Beyond, beyond my own lifetime. <laughs> you know, right, if the world right. goes like, into shit like the, like the <laughs> post-apocalyptic <laughs> films, I don't want my kids to be living in that world. So, you know, right. I don't want the icebergs to melt. And I, <laughs> I don't want everything to go to shit because I've got three kids that are yeah. going to live in that world. <laughs> right. It's one thing to think, well... You know, I'll be, you know, 90 or 100 something yeah. uh, if I live that long when that happens. But and then you think, well, it's a different thing. You think, well, my kids will be, you know, and they're, you know, uh, yeah, adults they're at this point. Right. And they may have kids. And, I, you know, I want like, so it, right. it kind of matters. It kind of matters. <laughs> but, you know, we, whether we have kids or not, we should be thinking about those things. But sure, having kids sure. definitely makes you <laughs> a little bit more. It makes uh, it more, yeah, it's more personal to you then. Exactly. Of an absolute, the whole. Like, well, you know, people that I don't know or I'm not related to, you know, you you can think about that, but it doesn't mean as much to you, even if you. Yeah. Should, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should, it should, because we're all one one big, you know, human family. But uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's different when you when you held that baby in your hand. I, do you have kids? Do you? No, I don't actually. But okay. I, yeah, I just thought it was. Yeah, I was just thinking myself. You know, if I did, would I look at this? You know, differently. Yeah, yeah. When you you know you hold the baby in your hand and you know you see that child grow and it's just a different uh, feeling. Um, and it, you know maybe not necessarily. I don't know. Uh, for me, for me, it was a transformative experience. Let me put it that way. And um, that was definitely a big part of of me hoping that things are going to be humanity is going to keep improving and keep getting better down the road. Mm -hmm. Sure. We haven't seen too much evidence of that uh, recently, but uh, hopefully that, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it looks bleak, doesn't it? <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's an optimism within us all, I think. And, you know, we, um, I certainly would like to hope that the best is going to prevail and, and somehow overcome the worst within us. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. You're absolutely right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you think of it as a marathon and not a sprint. Right. Um, right. I think, I think in the long run, I think the good will prevail. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a uh, kind of something bad to, to give people like so, a, a kickstart that they want to change, some, yeah, change things. To awaken. Exactly. Sometimes it takes a kickstart to awaken some, you know, thoughts and ideas and activism. And, and I think some of that happens, um, you know, in current affairs, some things will happen and then people react to that and, and you see that, and most of the times that's good. You know, mm -hmm. Not all, the, I'm sure there are exceptions. Sure. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because you can, you, can you can get complacent when things are just, uh, you know, fine, yeah, status quo. Exactly. Exactly. And, and sometimes life is so comfortable that you don't want it to change. Um, and you're not too worried about, or, or you're in denial about some of the repercussions. Because um, an immediate change would mean, you know, maybe a loss of income, maybe some inconvenience, maybe it would mean a change in lifestyle, um, which, all of which we'd like to avoid. We're, we're happy the way we are, uh, you know, if, if that is the case. And then um, if we believe that our actions will have some long-term consequences, we obviously don't want to accept that. That's, that's I think, human nature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was it about uh, uh, Henry uh, Ian Cusick uh, that you thought was right for him to play uh, Quint? You know, I, um, I I hadn't actually at that point. I even though I love science fiction and I love kind of that that whole genre, I hadn't really watched much of Lost. Um, so, 
I wasn't um, as familiar, though, though I, I, I knew of his character, I knew of him, and um, of the episodes I'd watched, I liked him the best, um, of all the characters of, you know, in Lost, in that universe, and the way he portrayed um, his character. But you know, when we, uh, what, what really clicked is when he and I were able to talk about the script and, um, you know, I, I think he has a an intelligence sort of in, in his face and 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 his his manner um, and a compassion uh, that I think was critical for this character Quint because you know he, the character himself goes into some very dark places and 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 I think it's very important for, for and the way Ian did just this amazing job of portraying him with um, as somebody who's extremely compassionate, whose heart is in the right place, and he's doing these things partly because he kind of, you know, he, he, he gets pushed um, by the antagonist in some cases, in some cases by his desire to save his kids um, into some very dark places, but, and he, but his heart is always in the right place. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then the audience has to now wonder when did he cross the line? At what point did he cross the line? Because by the end, you know, I think most people might feel that, you know, at some point the line was crossed. The question <laughs> is where right. and where. And, and Ian has that, that tremendous, um, I feel, uh, on the one hand, you know, he's believable as a scientist. Um, and, you know, but he's still very compassionate and there's, there's warmth as, as a parent that you need and in the sense he is also, you know, a, a amazing and, and loving parent to his children. So we wanted to capture, and I think he successfully captured that in, in the way Quint interacts with his own kids. Mm -hmm. it, is there any reason why you named the, the character Quint? Well, actually, <laughs> what happened is uh, I, I picked all the character names out of an, an old book. It's um, The Turn of the Screw. I don't know if you're familiar with that. With that it's a little 80 or 100 page book, uh, a novella, I guess, that I read um, I don't know, several, several years ago. But it stuck with me because what was fascinating uh, about that book, what I, I think, or maybe to me, it was the oldest book that I had read that used the unreliable narrator as a plot device. And so, so you're being told the story by this governess. And you kind of, you know, halfway through the story, or even earlier, you get clues about the fact that she may not be telling you the truth. But the story itself seems to be, by and large, true. And so, um, so I, you know, most of the names um, come out of there. In some cases, we've changed them a little bit. So we have Quint and then Miles and Flora, the two little kids in, in that book, and we've used those names. And uh, Jesse is also out of that book. I think in the book is Jessel. And I just you know, changed that a little bit. And then the narrator is always the governess. And, uh, you, know, you know, the Charlie um, or the other, the other um, lead actress in our film, uh, Jenna, who plays, Jenna Harrison, who plays Charlie, uh, that character, um, you see it on, on her lab coat and places. She's Dr. Governess. We kind of use that, um, that name for her. And then the... Um, in the book, you have the master. They only refer to him by that name, and I used I, I changed that to Master Sun. Mm -hmm. um, and then Master Sun has a um, has like a, a helper um, or a house. Um, what do you say? You know, it's an old English estate, and there's, there's a woman, Mrs. Gross, in the film, and we changed it to Dita Gross in the movie. <laughs> So yeah, I think the names are there just uh, because that was you know, it used to be a book that I really enjoyed and. and was you know amazed with how Henry James came up with this unreliable narrator that I think was fascinating. Yeah, <clears throat> it's interesting uh, how you can um, that's how you know you came up with the name. But uh, when you're watching something, how you can come up with a different uh, theory? Because uh, like when I heard Quint, I think of uh, I think of Jaws, and then I'm thinking, well, the character obviously doesn't really have much in common with the Quint. Except for the idea, I thought, well, maybe it's about, uh, you know, Quinn is really one, you know, narrow, not necessarily narrow-minded, but, like, he's a guy that's hunting the shark and really wants 
wants to kill the shark. And it's just kind of interesting that you can think of different uh, reasons. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just something simple like a name. Yeah, yeah. That I, I didn't. I did not even make that connection. But now that you do, you're right. Um, uh, there, there's Quinn. But I, yeah, I did not make that connection. I was kind of. I picked all the names of the characters in in the film out of yeah. um, out of turn of the screw. Mm-hmm. Um, something I I always think about um, when anything about like uh, harvesting, uh, uh, you know, cells or, or or like growing body parts or even maybe people thought about growing humans and then you're harvesting their uh their organs is uh mm-hmm. it's a slippery slope there because uh what point is that like a, a a person and not just you know a piece of uh a flesh or an organ uh that someone else could use and i think eventually when this stuff starts to to progress that's going to be a, a big question uh amongst you know when is this no longer just a tissue and it's it's a being yes yes i mean so i to me um the idea that you know you would um grow human organs within other um within another living being um mm-hmm. i i think that there's a lot of promise there's a lot of medical promise um mm-hmm. in that because you could you know, obviously transplant an organ that's, that's made out of your, essentially your tissue. I don't believe that, the, at least based on what I know, human society and morals and attitudes, that we would actually even take a clone, even if it was made expressly for that purpose, I don't believe mm. that anybody would say it's all right to, to kill another human being and harvest the, um, the organs to serve the donor of that um, you know, mm-hmm. from whom that clone was created. So what, what and I believe what sci- scientists today are, are looking at is, is growing human organs within pigs. So you could grow, you know, uh, like, like in our, in, in Chimera, the, the character grows pigs and uh, grows, grows livers and pancreases inside, mm-hmm. inside a pig, uh, inside different pigs. And, and that is based on, Again, again, you know, science that people are working on uh, as we speak. I don't believe that any transplants have yet taken place, but they are looking at developing human organs inside pigs. And I think, um, you know, many animal rights um, uh, people will mm-hmm. certainly disagree with you, but, but I think human, human beings will find it more acceptable to then, um, you know, harvest that organ from the animal. If, mm-hmm. if it's really my genetic material, but it grew inside another animal and it could be transplanted into me without any risk of rejection or any, you know, those other um, repercussions of a, of a transplant on that. Um, and, and maybe technology might even develop where you could um, genetically engineer the animal to be able to survive such a harvesting. So if it had its own um, liver and then, I mean, that's not the way we depicted it, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, if you have its own liver and then you, it grows, for example, a second one and you harvest the second one, but you can kind of leave the, you know, the animal could still survive, um, mm-hmm. and, and live out its natural life. So I think technology is pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing. And some of the solutions that are going to come out are things that we haven't even imagined. Um, right, but I, you know, it's a lot of fun to imagine the stuff and see what would yeah. happen. Definitely. So, uh, how was the movie? Uh, you said like people had uh, you know, talked about it after the screening at uh, Fantasa Fantasporto, I believe is the name of the the uh, the, um, yeah, yeah. the the screening. There. So, uh, yeah, how did it go over? What was the what was the uh, what was the feedback like? I, I think the the kind of the questions uh, that uh, that I got after the film um, were, were kind of along the lines of what you and I have been talking about. So it's sort of mm-hmm. almost uh, you know people were, were very curious about the science um, and people were very curious about the origins of such a story because I, I think most people felt um, that it's not your typical when, when you say science fiction and we've had a tough time. Kind of, because when you say science fiction, people immediately jump to you know the it's high like concept Star Wars or something, Star Wars or, or 
In superhero films, um, often you, you look in various classifications and they're, they're, they're slotted into the sci-fi genre. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, you know, people approach Chimera thinking it's something else, I think, sometimes. And I guess the best way that I've, I've figured, I've tried to position it as a sci-fi thriller. Um, it's also, you know, part drama, I guess, um, you know, part horror, a little bit of horror. There's a little bit of drama. There's a little bit of, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, so people, this is just yeah. real, real quick before you go on with that. It's something I talk about a lot on the show to me, just like a uh, genre of a movie is almost irrele irrelevant. It doesn't really matter to me. If I like the movie, I like the movie. It doesn't matter if it's science fiction, horror. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to like it less or more if it's science fiction and not horror or, or drama or anything like that. But I do realize that for a lot of people, it is important because you have to try to market it to a certain audience. And uh, if it's yeah. something that doesn't necessarily fit in somewhere, I, I assume it's, it's harder to do that. Yeah. And, and, and I think part of it is that uh, people expect when you say a certain genre, they expect a certain thing. And, and, you know, I, I certainly don't want to be responsible for misleading anyone into thinking Chimera is something that it's not. Um, but, but I think the audience um, was very, they came in thinking that it was science fiction. Um, they, they'd obviously seen a synopsis. Some of them might have caught the trailer uh, on YouTube. So I think they had a general sense of what it was, but I think they were still um, uh, um, pleasantly surprised, uh, I believe, by the fact that it's not your typical story, that there's things that the areas that we go to that, um, you know, other other stories don't venture in those directions. And so mm -hmm. there, and there's this kind of thought-provoking debate uh, that we, kind of like you and I have been having for the last, you know, yeah. 30 odd minutes. Um, yeah, a little bit like that. It was fun. It was, it was a ton of fun mm -hmm. because lo lots of great questions from the audience and high level of engagement. I mean, everybody was <laughs> still sitting at the end of it. Nobody left. Uh, I was just thrilled yeah. with that. Yeah, of course, of course, I felt like her. <laughs> yeah. You just don't want people yeah, walking out in your movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I would assume that would be very satisfying um, that people are actually, you know, talking after the movie about uh, about the, the, the different ideas in the film. Because uh, that, that's what you were going for. And yeah, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, there's not too many movies out there anymore that people actually talk about uh, afterwards besides like, hey, it wasn't that cool or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you like it? A yes or no yes, kind of answer. I, yeah, no, yeah. right, right. And then the conversation ends. I mean, to me, that's less satisfying than, you know, hey, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't agree with that. And, and, you know, that sparks a debate. I mean, when I, when my kids were, were younger, one of the things we used to do, and we, as a family, we used to all love, love the movies. And, you know, I would come out of the film and, I wouldn't let them, you know, if, if we were to see a film, I wouldn't let them um, just get away with saying, uh, yes, I like the film, or no, I didn't like the film. Even if it's an animated film, I'd say, hey, why did the character do that? What do you think? Was it right or wrong? And, you know, kind of force them <laughs> to, and I think um, now when they look back, they probably understand why I was trying to do it. But, and after a while, it became a family ritual, and we'd come out, with, you know, whether it was um, even like uh, Finding Nemo, but you could still find things, you know, to discuss. And I think, I think if a storyteller has created a universe that engages you um, and where it's, it's open-ended, uh, you can have some fascinating debate and enlightening debate because you will then go and research things or you will explore the idea in your own head. Um, not because the film gives you information, but because you find that on your own, which I think is always yeah. better. Mm -hmm. I yeah I agree hundred percent. It it just uh, it puts the questions in your head and like hey I'd like to you know look more into this or I wonder if this is based exactly. on any you know thing that is is actually going on and uh, I personally like that kind of movie myself too. Just uh, real quick, um, this week I actually went to a screening for Annihilation. It was advanced screening, and uh, it's si a similar thing we're talking about here because it's marketed. I think it's totally different than the movie is. Uh, the, the trailers make it seem like it's a creature movie and it's really more of a thinking science fiction movie. And I could tell most of the people there were, were like kind of bored by it cause they were expecting, you know, 
uh, this movie with all these monsters attacking everybody. And there are a couple bits of very, it's a really small part of the film, but that's all you really see in the trailer. And so kind of, I think it hurts because people have a different expectation. Right. And I think, I think that is what uh, we're trying to figure out is, is the right niche. I saw the, I read about the film. I'm with, it's going to be fun. Um, and it sort of reminded me the story, whatever I read, of an old Russian film called Stalker. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, but it, it, the, the universe and, and you know, these, these people venturing into space where um, um, presumably an alien craft or some alien force has, has landed and, and where the universe is not, doesn't operate under mm-hmm. the normal uh, laws of our known universe. Um, right. And I don't know whether there's anything like that at all. I'm waiting to get back to LA, and you know that's on the top of my list uh, of, of movies to watch. And yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, there's, there's some cool stuff going on out there, and we could just, you know, I hope I can find a a nice uh, a nice niche for for Chimera, and you know, we're a much smaller film, and in no way comparable sure, yeah, to yeah, Annihilation. Yeah, I was just uh, comparing just the idea of uh, of what genre you know the, the movie fits in yeah yeah you're absolutely right it, it's hard to and because you know for us to find our audience i think there's a core group of hard sci-fi fans out there that would really enjoy a film like chimera um mm-hmm. and I, you know we're getting the word and reaching them getting the word of this film out to them and reaching them is really difficult um mm-hmm. and then but we you know we're going to try we're going to do our best and and you know being on your show is Kind of one part of that, and hopefully, you know, that helps us get the word out, and more people will will will, will click on Chimera, or you know, put add it to their queue and watch it, and you know, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, along those lines, how how can how do you find uh, a Chimera? How how will people be able to watch it? Um, right now, we're we we're, the plan is to we're not going to do a lot of um, kind of film festivals, but we're going to do a few because it helps us get some, um, you know, reviews and a little bit of buzz around the film. We're working um, with a couple of really great um, international uh, sales companies who, and, and once we've locked into to one, we will, um, you know, we'll try to make the film available around the world. And then in the U.S., obviously, um, we're, we're, again, our, our sales uh, our distribution company will help us put it out. Hopefully, Netflix, iTunes, you know, wherever we can put it out. I mean, we made the work for it to be seen. Um, sure. We'd like to get, obviously, for our investors to get a, um, a return on their investment, or at least the investment, <laughs> not a return. And so that's right. kind of, you know, part it's of it. Pay for itself. Yeah, it has to pay for itself. Well, if it doesn't pay for itself, you know, it's, it gets harder for for me to maybe have a second um, to do project. Stuff. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I'd love to do a you know a second project, but I I believe it's my um, sort of uh, duty to my investors, my fiduciary duty to make sure that they um, are, are treated well and fairly and, and get a return. Hopefully, at, at least not not a return on their investment necessarily, but a return off their investment would be great. Even uh, because you know exactly. it's independent yeah. film is a tough business. Is <laughs> financially it's a tough business. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, what made you get into the filmmaking? I read, you know, just your quick bio on IMDb, but uh, I'm sure you can explain it better. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I, I think I mentioned I, you know, I trained. Uh, my, my undergraduate degree is in mechanical engineering, and I worked as a mechanical engineer for a number of years. Um, and I came to the U.S. to get a, bus- uh, a business degree. I got an MBA and uh, went to work on Wall Street. I was an investment banker. Uh, for a few years, and then um, I I started a software company with my friend um, Jay, who I mentioned earlier, who's co-produced this uh, this film. He was my classmate, both at the undergraduate level, and then also um, when we went to Wharton. Um, and so what we did is, you know, we were kind of later in life, and we were starting to get. Um, maybe a little bored with, because we kind of had these three different careers. Jay had also worked as an engineer. He'd um, 
worked as a strategy consultant while I after business school and I've been an investment banker. And then we started a software company together. And we wanted to do something different. Um, and Jay challenged me. He said, you know, you are you always said you were a writer. You always said that's something you wanted to do. And when I was at college, I used to kind of write. And so he said, why don't you do something? And um, um, I challenged myself. I had a, I was, I had a car ride from, from, from Mumbai, which is where my, my business is. And um, about eight hours away, my parents live in, in a smaller Indian city. And I was visiting them, and I was uh, in a car. And I came up with sort of the one, the, the, the long line of the film um, on that car ride. And then, you know, I, I took some classes, um, online classes, and uh, to, 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 to learn how to write a screenplay. That eventually mm-hmm. became, uh, became Chimera. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> go on, sorry. No, I mean, it's, it's kind of a roundabout route, you know, and, and kind of life takes you on this, um, on this journey and you never know where you're going to end up. Um, because I never thought, if you had asked me when I was, you know, 30 years old um, and I was in investment banking and I loved it, and I was working on Wall Street and um, I was having fun and really enjoying that, that whole that, hey, are you going to go out and make an independent film later in your life? And say, are you crazy? <laughs> this is what I want to be doing. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you never know what, what twists and turns await you around the corner. And I think that's what makes it so exciting. Um, you know, we all cannot imagine what's going to happen tomorrow. And life yeah. surprises us. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what science fiction movies or TV or story uh, uh, get you into, in, into science fiction? Um, well, the, the movies that I think really, um, sort of inspired or, you know, when we, some, somebody asked, what are your comps for Chimera? And I, you know, don't have comps, but the big, uh, films that, that I look up to and that I really enjoyed, or, you know, films like Gattaca. I, I don't know if you remember that. It's about yeah. Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman. Um, it was a great film, I thought. Um, I, I love the Cronenberg's version of The Fly, uh, for example. Mm-hmm. I thought that was, uh, you know, another superb, uh, uh, it just immensely uh, thought-provoking film. And um, so, the, you know, those kind of sci-fi. Um, and then, of course, HBO recently, Westworld, I thought was was excellent. I yeah, really enjoyed fantastic. it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a unique <laughs> universe. Uh-huh. That you have not, yeah. you know, I, I love uh, I love Inception, for example. It's you know it's huge, but the idea mm-hmm. of, of because yeah, the, the the most that film to me just uh, I mean apart from the fact that it's it's just gorgeous what they did and what they put on the screen, um, but the idea that that that's behind the film um, is that the human mind is so complex that if you want somebody to truly believe something, they have to think that they came up with the idea by themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think any parent, any parent will, will kind of understand that concept, you know, intuitively, because when you have a child and you want a child to, for example, you know, really embrace certain behaviors, then the parent has to kind of do what, the characters in the film did and plant the idea in you know into the into the child's mind in a way that the child believes is their idea and so i kind of maybe because of my own parenting experiences which is kind of what, what you talked about earlier i really enjoyed inception uh, just immensely and of course mm-hmm. it's just beautiful the spectacle as it unfolds on the screen it just completely transforms you. And, you know, the Matrix is another of my all-time. So I kind of the really well done, like the Matrix and Inception, um, and then you've got these. I wouldn't call them indie films; they're still you know big films with great actors and, and amazing directors, like like The Fly and um, and Gattaca, and then of course Westworld. So that's kind of my <laughs> universe that I I enjoy. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, just real quick, uh, quick about Westworld. I'm I'm really looking forward to season two. And after how season one did, did not to spoil for anyone who hasn't watched yet. Uh, it's it's weird to think that the show would continue. I think it has to mm-hmm. really change uh, and open up. Uh, you know, for this for for them to keep making more of them. 
Yeah, because what was um, sort of sort of uh, the one thing they did with Westworld season one was this constraint that I, I talked about earlier, where you said this is compatible with my world, the, the universe as I know it. And you, as an extension of that, you could say that okay, everything works in the world the way I know it. You know, there are no human robots here. This because you and I know that I, like I don't have a robot in my room. There, right. You know, there's no robots around us. Um, but in in that um, that that resort, Westworld, these mm -hmm. this technology exists at some far off place, and and it's contained there. So so we don't interact with it in our lives. So it's compatible with. Mm -hmm. But but if one of those creatures comes into our world, or not, I mean not creatures, one of the what do they call them, hosts, mm -hmm. right? If one of the hosts comes into our world, um, then now now that you've opened up. So, so now you're in a in a world which is not necessarily compatible with the world as we know it. But you know that's a creative choice that they've made, and um, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with it. But season one, I yeah, thought it was, was, was beautiful. <laughs> I oh it. yeah, I, I loved it. There was uh, so many you know uh, twists uh, that you didn't see coming, but totally made sense too. It wasn't like it was just a uh, twist for the sake of it. And uh, yeah. it's the, the great show. I, I loved it. And uh, and, yeah, and, yeah. and kind of like uh, Chimeria, you're talking about, like, there's a lot of stuff that's happening today that you kind of take in the future where you're going to go with it. I mean, you mm -hmm. see all the time now about about this, this sex dolls people are building. And, and yeah. right now it's very primitive, but, in, uh, you know, it's totally conceivable in 50 years or whatever that they would be that, of course, are going to keep advancing. And uh, so it's not like out of the realm of possibility that so a place like oh, this no, would no. exist. Yeah, not at all. And, and I think what you do is if you combine what's happening, like the sort of sex dolls and, and, and you know, and maybe some, some kind of cloning. It's artificial intelligence. Yeah. With artificial, exactly. You, 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 that's exactly what I was going to say. If you combine that with artificial intelligence, then you've got sort of, you know, this host-like uh, beings. And and that of course opens up this whole question: of, Is are, are they human, and what rights do they have, and yeah. you know, can we yeah. use them in that fashion? And, right. Yeah, what is beautiful. what Especially. is what is life? You know, what it what is life? You know, uh, slaver. There's all kinds of uh, questions to to be asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why Westworld was so great um, because it it kind of brings up all these, but you're still telling a very entertaining story, and you know, you're you're watching each episode, and you're like, wow, okay, this was fun, and. You know, so, so because what, what many of us, myself included, you know, there's, there's a time when we like to learn and research and, and there's a time when we want to just have fun and, the, you know, and be entertained. And when you're being entertained, if you can also at the same time, you know, open your mind up to certain ideas, I think that's sort of a uh, best of all worlds scenario. And, I, I and agree 100%. Best of, yeah, the best of sci-fi does that. Yeah, yeah, because you can watch it. Uh, there's like layers there. You can watch it as just kind of escapism and it's fun to watch. Yeah. But then if you want to get more in depth, there's a lot more to it. Right. And it stays with you. So you can think about it later and, 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 you know, and then explore it in your own head. Um, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, yeah, if, if it's really thought provoking, interesting sci-fi, then it does that. It stays with you for a while. Years later, you'll be thinking about it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. so the the website i'll put it up on the link on on our website but uh chimera the movie.com um where else can you can you follow you know what's happening with the film oh yeah well, so we you know we have a twitter account that we we update with uh, as much uh, you know information as we have when, when we have screenings when we'll um if we're able to bring the film out maybe we do a couple of screenings in LA and New York um, and maybe some other cities as well. We'll be, we'll be regularly updating the information on our Facebook page, which is Chimera 2018 and on Twitter and Instagram, uh, where Chimera the movie um, it, on both those platforms. And of course, there's uh, www.chimerathemovie.com, which is, which is our website. So, yeah. You know, we'll try to get as much information out there. We love for people to um, be involved with the film and support it and watch it and, and tell yeah. us what you think. Definitely. And I almost forgot because uh, this came up uh, before we started recording. 
was I, I'm in I'm in Massachusetts. I live in Cape Cod, but I do go to Boston a lot. And uh, you filmed uh, the movie in Boston, I understand. Yes, yes, we did. We filmed the movie in uh, in, a, in a city called Fitchburg, Massachusetts. I'm not mm-hmm. sure you're familiar with that. It's I think it's about forty to fifty miles, maybe forty miles west of Boston. Yeah. And um, people who don't know, real quick, uh, um, anything that happens in any city, like in in Massachusetts. Usually, people just say it's Boston. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we, you know, a lot of our our crew. Um, uh, so we had a fast, you know, very talented and experienced crew. They all uh, mostly, I think, from the from the greater Boston area that that came out and, and worked on this project. Um, but the reason we went to Fitchburg is we discovered um, just through online research. And we connected with the owners of a an abandoned, you know, chemical research and manufacturing facility, which ended up forming the um, uh, the the, the uh, location for the entire film. So everything you see, you know, we, we had very limited budget by way of um, props and art design, um, production design, but uh, we were lucky to find this location that had a lot of what we wanted like it was tailor-made for quinn to go there and set up his lab and so um we ended up uh, we ended up shooting there and then we also connected with a group uh, that comes out and, and and does um they have kind of war games on on weekends so you, you know we have some scenes with the swat and and they were also mostly massachusetts or kind of in the new england area and they come out and they and they so they had all the gear and it's so Massachusetts in many ways, uh, more ways than one helped us um, get Chimera made. Um, we also, um, you know, all of, of course, the, the top four or five actors and are, were not from Massachusetts, but um, all of the supporting uh, characters and all of the extras are from, from Massachusetts as well. What did you, th- what did you think of Massachusetts? Well, we, we love shooting there. I mean, Fitchburg was very welcoming to us. Um, and we, we were kind of locked away, I guess, in this. It's, a, it's an industrial area, an industrial park. And uh, we were, we, our, our crew was sort of within that the entire time. But, uh, you know, the, the, all the vendors in that area, that, that local Fitchburg community, we, we had a bunch of apartments within, um, Within an apartment complex in Fitchburg, and they were all very, they were a little, you know, curious about the film. And some of them came out. Some of the people from our um, our apartment complex came out. I think towards the end of our shoot, maybe on the last day, we invited them, and they came out to our set. And you know, it was it was it was great. We um, they were very supportive, and they've been asking, you know, when I've been in touch with a couple of them, and when is the film coming out? Because they don't understand why it's taking this long, and. I, I wish there was a way for, <laughs> to get it out sooner, but hopefully, hopefully this, you know, soon, hopefully this summer we'll, we'll be able to be on multiple platforms and, and, you know, have people be able to watch and enjoy this film. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, I, I appreciate coming on today. It's uh, I thought it was a great uh, uh, chat with you, a great uh, conversation. Well, well, thank you for, for inviting me. I certainly enjoyed talking to you. I hope I was able to answer your questions. If you, if anything else comes up, you know, just shoot me an email or, um or, or call me you have my number now and and we can uh yeah. you know i'll be happy to answer anything but yeah thank you for inviting me on your show i i enjoyed the chat very much very cool thank you and uh, everyone should check out uh chimera i i really enjoyed it and it's uh it's uh, definitely something different and uh i think that's a good thing well thank you we appreciate appreciate you saying that well, this is Barbara Magnolfi of Suspiria, and you're listening to Without Your Head. <laughs>